This is the Isle of Dogs. Lying in a loop of the River Thames between Limehouse and Blackwall, about two miles east of the Tower of London. Across the river to the south is the village of Greenwich, with its famous Royal Naval College and Observatory. In the centre lie the West Indian and Millwall docks, where the ships from all over the world had their cargoes loaded and unloaded. These docks are now closed. The walls and factories which once lined the river bank have vanished or lie derelict. In 1981, in an attempt to halt this industrial decline, the government appointed a development corporation with special powers to attract new investment to Docklands. Part of the island into an enterprise zone. Today, the once bustling quays are empty sites awaiting the developers, while new roads and offices are being built. This is a time of uncertainty for the people who live here, Traditional jobs have been swept away. Many people are out of work. And they are not sure what the future will bring. But for most of the past, the island was a busy scene of industry and community life. The first docks were built here in 1800 to handle trade with the West Indies. Shipbuilding and repairing yards were set up round the edge of the island. Walls and factories appeared. And Millwall became famous for its ships and its engineering products. Thousands of people came here to live and work. Before the docks were built and the factories and streets of houses sprang up, the island had been an entirely different place. Close to the city of London, but isolated from it, for hundreds of years it was a lonely, windswept open space. Sheep grazed in the fields and a few cottages were the only signs of human habitation. The story of this pre-industrial time can only be told in outline, drawing on various sources of illustration to highlight the main events. Archaeological evidence shows that thousands of years ago the River Thames followed a different course and a great forest ran down to its banks. When the first docks were built in the island in 1800, the fossilised remains of these trees were discovered beneath the ground. This part of the forest disappeared long ago and gradually the river took its present course, curving round in a wide U-shape to enclose the tongue of land or isthmus. Because of its low-lying position, the island has been threatened with flooding throughout its history. This is normally prevented by the embankment, a wall of earth which runs round the edge of the island. Early settlers, the Saxons, the Danes, or even the Romans, built up this wall so that they could use the land for farming. In fact, there is the Romans ever did come onto the island, although they had a settlement at nearby Old Fold. In Saxon times, the area was part of Stebbenheath, the modern Stepney. The Doomsday Book, a survey of England written in the 11th century for William the Conqueror, records that land in Stebbenheath was used for ploughing, grazing and for feeding hogs, and that there were seven mills. Until the 16th century, this land was owned by the bishops of London and was worked on by others. Peasants of those days were obliged to give free labour and part of their produce to their landlords. In return, they had certain common rights, such as free grazing and firewood. By the 14th century, these conditions began to change. The plague of the Black Death, early in the century, killed so many people that labour became scarce. Peasants were gradually released from feudal bondage for wages instead. Some common rights were withdrawn and rents and taxes were increased. The rising cost of living caused so much hardship that in 1381 the peasants rebelled and thousands of people from Kent and Essex marched to London to see the king, hoping that he would help them. At a meeting at Mile End, just to the north of the island, 
an agreement was drawn up granting most of the peasants' demands. When the king was safely back in London, the agreement was withdrawn. The crowds of angry and frustrated people were dispersed by the army, the ringleaders were arrested and an uneasy peace was restored. <laughs> Even in peaceful times, the people of the Middle Ages who lived on the Isle of Dogs had to work hard to survive. Their homes were huts of wood or stone, and they made a living from farming, ploughing the land, sowing corn in spring, reaping and gathering in the harvest. They had a little chapel of their own. It the island, close to the road which led from Poplar High Street down to the ferry on the river bank opposite Greenwich. This chapel of St Mary was attached to St Dunstan's Church in Stepney, which was originally built in the 10th century. The chapel was used until the 15th century, when, in 1448, the embankment wall was broken by a very high tide and water flooded over the island, driving away the inhabitants and destroying their crops and homes. The chapel building remained and was later turned into a farmhouse. It could still be seen until the middle of the 19th century, when it was demolished and made way for Millwall Dock. After the big flood of 1448, most of the land remained wet and marshy for many years, as the old name suggests, Stebbenheath Marsh. On several occasions between the 14th and 19th centuries, special commissions were appointed to survey the marsh and repair the bank and drains. Some of the people who lived within the bank had a duty to maintain their own section, but it was a never-ending task. The strong winds and high tides kept coming. In the 1660s, Samuel Pepys, passing this way to use the ferry, recorded in his diary that he had seen a thousand acres under water near Limehouse. This was after another high tide had poured through a gap in the bank. This and other floods created a permanent inland lake, marked on maps as the Breach or Poplar Gut. The name, Isle of Dogs, first appeared in the 16th century, and its true origin is unknown. The most popular name is that when kings and queens of England lived in the royal palace at Greenwich and went hunting in Epping Forest, they kept their hunting dogs on Stevenheath Marsh, just across the river. Sailors passing their ships heard the dogs barking and gave the island its peculiar name. Another story is that of the murdered traveller. A man and his dog came to the riverbank and called for a boat. The waterman who ferried them across robbed and murdered the traveller while the dog jumped into the water and escaped. Later he returned to pester the murderer, causing such a commotion that the guilty man confessed to his crime and was hanged. The last one is really the Isle of Ducks, or that it is an old word meaning water lilies, boats or dikes. 
A map of the 16th century shows a small island called the Isle of Dogs, just off the southwest corner of the embankment. And probably this name was gradually applied to the whole area. The main mill wall is mined. Seven mills were recorded in the Doomsday Book Survey of Stebbenheath, and windmills appear in later maps and drawings, standing on the western embankment of the island. These windmills may have been built to grind corn as long ago as Saxon times. Corn was grown on the island until the 15th century and could have been brought here by boat from Kent and Essex or down the River Lee from Hertfordshire. There is no definite proof that the mills recorded in the Doomsday Book are the same set on the Isle of Dogs. These millwall mills are more likely to have been built much later as part of a drainage system. Whatever their purpose, they were a noticeable landmark for passing sailors. The island in the 17th century was known as a cold and lonely place. Samuel Pepys described one of his visits here as follows. Up and betimes, by six o'clock at Deptford. And there I find Sir George and my lady ready to go. I being in my new coloured silk suit and coat, trimmed with gold buttons, and in my hands, very rich and fine by water to the ferry, where when we come, no coach there, and tide of ebb so far spent as the horse boats could not get off the other side of the river to bring away the coach. So we were fain to stay there on the unlucky Isle of Dogs, the morning cool and wind fresh, above two if not three hours, to our great discomfort. Anon the coach comes. In the meantime, they're coming a news thither with his horse to go over. The ferry crossing used by Samuel Pepys had a long history. When there were no bridges or tunnels in this stretch of the river, it was the only means of communication between the north and south banks. Records of the ferry date back to the 15th century and it was in use until the end of the 19th century. The ferry could be reached by the path on top of the embankment or by the road from Poplar High Street, Arrow or Harrow Lane, through the fields and past the old chapel to the river bank. The southern end of this old road is the modern East Ferry Road and it still leads to the ferry house close by the slipway from which the ferry operated. The ferry crossing to Deptford is commemorated in Deptford Ferry Road behind the modern Vulcan public house. By the 18th century, the drains and embankments had been repaired and improved so that most of the land could be used for pasture. In the 1770s, one writer described it as a spot of ground of such fertility and excellence of grass that it not only raises the largest cattle, but it is likewise the great restorative of all distempered beasts. Another writer in 1798 observed, the ground is divided by ditches which empty themselves through sluices at low water into the Thames and keep this sufficiently dry. It is perhaps the richest grass in the country. Herds of cattle and sheep were brought here by drovers to be fattened up for the London markets. Butchers came round to choose animals for slaughter. High prices were paid for meat raised on the island and it was in great demand for the special feasts and banquets that the rich enjoyed. The green fields surrounding London were built over in the 18th century as trade and industry expanded and population increased. Development spread along the banks of the Thames and at Limehouse and Blackwall, close to the island, there were shipyards and docks. 
Poplar High Street, which ran across the top of the island, was built up with houses and small industries. The first signs of the industrial activity of the future appeared on the island in the 18th century. A map of the 1750s shows the breach or poplar gut later to be chosen as the site of the West India docks. Just to the south, on the western embankment, is the line of windmills which were demolished in the 19th century to make way for factories. At the point where the little island had lain offshore entry was now an inlet, a small natural dock where a three-storied mast house was built by 1780. It was similar to Perry's famous mast house at Back Wall, and ships came alongside to have their masts raised and fitted. Mast House Terrace, behind the Magnet and Dewdrop pub, commemorates this early industrial site. The land around the mast house, and extending inland from it, was purchased by the Ironmongers Company in 70. They owned three fields, the barn field, the Great Barnfield and the Little Barnfield, old names which still survive today. From the mast house, the path ran round the embankment to the ferry and a building called the Starch House. On the eastern embankment was Root's Yard, an 18th century dry dock or slipway for ship repair. Close by stood the Folly House, an inn or restaurant built in the middle of the city. It was a popular spot for those with money and time to spare. We finished our walk and dined at a small house called The Folly on the water's edge, almost opposite the splendid hospital at Greenwich, where we sat for some hours enjoying a delicious view and the moving picture of a succession of shipping perpetually passing and repassing. These few buildings by the water and the chapel house farm and cottages in the centre stood isolated in the midst of windswept grassland surrounded by the wide waters of the River Thames. Flooding was still a danger and people were attracted to live on the island. The few inhabitants lived a simple and hard working life, herding the animals, keeping up the embankments, fishing and working in the mills or the mast house. On fine days in spring and summer, people visited the island to walk along the wall and view the shipping, or gaze over at Deptford Dockyard and the fine buildings at Greenwich. The river was alive with many parts of the world, as well as rowing boats and barges. This traffic increased during the 18th century, and by the 1790s, the walls and quays in the Pool of London were overcrowded with cargoes, and the river itself was full of ships waiting to load and unload. Merchants and ship owners asked Parliament for permission to build new enclosed wet docks on the open spaces of the Isle of Dogs. The West India docks were opened in the early century. Shipbuilding and engineering industries were soon established along the riverbank and streets of houses were built for the workers. The marshy grassland was to become an industrial town. <laughs> 